right, Carol. Nice to see you. Thanks so much for having me. First question. Let's start with your numerous prizes, which are very impressive. So you've won uh, numerous prizes, among them the Orwell Prize, and you've been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Still, the work you do is anything but easy, and you've also been facing lawsuits against you. So what's life like of an investigative reporter? What keeps you going, and, and what's scary at times? Um, yeah, so what is life like as an investigative reporter in 2022? Mm -hmm. And my answer would have to be, it's a bit shit. <laughs> Um, I was thinking, actually, I came yesterday for this rehearsal here, and I was like, oh my goodness, it feels so exposing standing on this 360-degree stage. And that, essentially, is what it's like being an investigative journalist, is that you are exposed to scrutiny and to attacks and to criticism and to lawsuits and everything else. And you're, you're very exposed, and actually, you're not protected. And it's been a really quite terrible kind of couple of years, I have to say, um, which culminated in a... I was sued for libel in London in January by one of the subjects of my investigation, a man, the man who bankrolled Brexit. And I reported that um, this man had been in communication with the Russian ambassador mm -hmm. in London. And... I gave a TED talk. I, I printed all this in the Guardian Observer. And then a year later, I gave a talk at TED about the threats to democracy. And in that talk, there were 23 words um, about this man. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, he sued me. And that's been... And essentially, he, you know, he managed to chill not just my reporting yeah. into this subject, but the reporting of any other journalist in Britain, essentially. So, and I had to crowd on my defence. So I've been very lucky in that I had 30,000 people, I think, contribute yeah. towards my legal costs. But it's, um, it still wasn't enough. And I'm still awaiting judgment. So that's why I think this idea of being on this sort of stage is that I've kind of hidden myself away, actually, for quite a lot of the last year. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, um, yes, that was a long-winded answer. Mm. <laughs> that's astonishing. Wow, wow. <laughs> you, you truly deserve... Yeah. Because the work you're doing is so important, and you're dealing with, with threats to our democrat democratic systems. So which are the different actors that you see? You know, what do you think are their motives, and, and what kind of a role does technology, especially social networks, play in this? Well, I think it's really interesting being here in Helsinki, because um, you, of course, have understood so much more about these threats which we're facing in these times than I think a lot of other nations. Mm -hmm. And certainly Britain and America, I think, are among those. And, you know, my, the thing is with my, this investigation, so my investigation into Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and social media and fake news, that began in November 2016. Mm -hmm. And it's all really entwined. Mm -hmm. So my investigation into Facebook, and very quickly also, involved the subject of Russian interference. And that's been a thread which has been going all the way through. And as I say, that's the one which has seen me being sued by this particular individual. And, you know, it's, it's, I think there are a lot of journalists who, certainly in Britain, you know, felt that this moment of when, you know, the world suddenly woke up mm -hmm. to actually, yes, Putin is a threat. Mm -hmm. You know, Putin is a threat not just to Ukraine, but to the Western, the entire Western order. And, you know, there have been journalists who have been uh, warning, investigating, reporting, trying to wake the world up to that threat and have failed, essentially. I mean, certainly in Britain, we failed, I think, to, to convey the importance of that mm. and, and why it was so grotesque, actually, mm. that London has been an absolute sewer, a vector for Russian corruption. Mm. And that impacts you. You know, you are here, like, literally in the front line of that. Mm. And we, in Britain, we have a responsibility to you in that we failed you, we failed the West, essentially, by sort of taking that seriously. Mm. Um, so, yes, you know, I think suddenly there is now this increasing awareness. Mm. But one of those things, which is not just the money, but my particular interest, 
which is the subversion of social media, the subversion of our tech platforms by countries, not just, but including Russia, mm. that still isn't really taken seriously. And we know that it's still going on in real time now. We know these influ influ influence operations are working. And we know the tech companies, mm. you know, they don't put enough money into it. They don't put enough resource into it. They don't open up their technology for others to look at it. And, and that's where... You know, I, it, I think we are in a really worrying moment. Mm. I'm not so sure I shouldn't say that here in Helsinki. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you've got a lot of shelters and things. Sorry, wrong thing to say. <laughs> no worries, we know what you mean. Um, well, well, adding on to that, I think, about the tech companies, you know, I can't help but ask about the Cambridge Analytica investigation. So are there some insights that you could share about that? I think I was thinking about it earlier in the sense that because, you know, there's so many security professionals, obviously, who are here at this conference. And it, what was really interesting about the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook story was that Facebook, that one of their refusals to take it seriously and to bury the evidence and refuse to answer journalist questions until, you know, I'd been working on that story for 18 months before we sort of published the big expose in The Guardian and The New York Times. And we had a whistleblower who sort of literally had the, the receipts. He literally had, you know, he could show, he could prove that this data came out of Facebook and then was used by this company in... Uh, in you know political political elections around the world actually and but it was so interesting because facebook they their response to us when we started putting in our our sort of right to replies to the company they were, became really adamant they were like this is not a data breach mm. because they were looking at it from this you know this very technical point of view yeah. this wasn't a technical cyber breach therefore it wasn't a data breach and 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 that's why they they sort of you know, they kind of crumbled then when, it, you know, we revealed that actually, of course, it, in that sense, it wasn't because they actually oversaw that data going. You know, they allowed that data to go into the hands of this bad actor. They were responsible. In that sense, you know, they oversaw their own data breach. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yes, I did find that really interesting. And, and I think that that's, you know, that there is, it's a sort of wider... C conception, I suppose, yeah. of cybersecurity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In this room, we have many courageous business leaders who are working in the cybersecurity industry. So why is it important for them to be aware of the subtle powers trying to influence our society? And is there something the cybersecurity industry in particular could help with? I mean, you know, you guys are like so on the front line. I mean, you know, without you protecting our personal data mm. and the ways that we know that there are these bad actors, these nation states who want to get hold of that data and criminals, of course, as well. So in that sense, you know, what you are doing, it, you know, it couldn't be more important. Mm. And, um, you know, I think that, I think that thing of, you know, I, I, I you know, that I think a lot of people, that the, the, the reason why Cambridge Analytica and Facebook was an interesting moment, because it was that moment for a lot of people when they suddenly realized, oh, okay, I, I get it, I understand how this data, you know, it, my personal information could be used and could be used against me in this very harmful way. Mm. And... Um, and, you know, so as well, of course, there's like, you know, there's business consequences. There's massive business consequences now if you don't look after people's data in the sense that, and, yeah. you know, in terms of trust. But I think also in that conception of like, what's the worst possible thing that could happen mm. if somebody got hold of your data, your mm. company's data? Like, what, what is the worst possible scenario that it could be used for? And that is the, you know, because that probably is where it would end up in that sense. So, yeah, so thank you very much for your work in keeping us safe. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, uh, we know those bad actors are out there, essentially. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So how important is a free press to create stability in democracies? I mean, without a free press, there is no democracy. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, 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 at a personal level, I have to say that in Britain, it doesn't actually feel like we have a free press at the moment. Certainly for me, I, you know, I haven't been, mm. I haven't been free 
to um, continue my reporting. Mm. And, um, and, you know, I haven't fundamentally, you know, our laws were weaponized by mm. somebody who, you know, could do so just through having a lot of money, essentially. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think we have to, mm. we have to cherish it. Yeah. And particularly, I mean, um, I think in Finland you have very good sort of public media, don't you? Mm. You know, uh, state-sponsored yes. uh, media, not state-run, state but yeah. public broadcasting. And that is so important because we know, we know that mm. if there isn't good sources of information, that bad sources of information will mm. flow into that vacuum. So I sort of think, you know, in this part of the world, I think the understanding or, uh, of mm. the need for these strong institutions, of which the press is one, is understood yeah. much better, as I say, than it is mm. in other parts of the world. But, you know, you're not immune also to mm. the ways that that can be eroded. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit with my questions, and the next one is going to be a little different as well. But, you know, this interview is titled Th Threats to Democracy. So, you know, th there are many that we can all name, but from your point of view, what are the biggest ones at the moment? I mean, I, you know, I, I think there is, there is a real question mark mm. about whether democracy is going to survive mm. the age of social media, this hyper-connected reality that we are all in, mm. and the fact that this is... This, this, this hyper-connection is going through just a handful of monopolistic US and Chinese companies mm. that are, operate as black boxes, of which there's been no proper regulation, and are a threat surface. I mean, I think that, if nothing else, is what we should be taking away from the current moment. Yeah. You know, that... Um, what, you know, what I find so fascinating and what I feel is, ha you know, the West hasn't woken up to is the fact that the Russia's incursion on Ukraine was preceded by an attack on its information sphere, mm. it, on the same, you know, on social media sites. Mm. And at exactly the same time, 2014, exactly the same time they did this in Ukraine, they also attacked the West in the same way. That was when the operations in America began. Mm. And, um, you know, that was invisible. So that's what, so, you know, I began this investigation in 2016 because in 2016, we were all completely oblivious to this. Mm. I mean, I think maybe there are probably people in this room who weren't, who did realise. But I think for the general public, we just didn't realise the ways that these technology platforms mm. were so vulnerable to yeah. bad actors and could be so misused. And just actually, you know, I think the, the thing about just their very business models, the way that they optimise for virality mm. is in itself a threat to democracy mm. because it's just the bad guys who are good at that. I mean, that's the thing. The bad guys are really good at doing engaging content um, which scares you mm. or that's hateful and it goes, or is just completely untrue, but goes completely viral. Mm. And, you know, I think w we see that happening. It's all across the world. And we can all see that because we see these populist and authoritarian governments which are on the rise, you know, in so many different parts of the world. And, you know, there is a direction of travel here, mm -hmm. and that has gone hand in hand with this preeminence of social media as being our sort of prime information mm -hmm. zone. Yeah. Final question for me, and then we're going to open it up and, and take a couple questions from the audience. So is there anything you can reveal about your current work? Well, it's, it's, it's more of the same. I mean, I feel that, uh, you know, I, 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 I feel this is still so badly understood. I feel that we are still in such a critical mm. moment. And as I say, this is all interwoven. My investigation into Russian interference, into fake news and social media, into the particular monopolistic power of Facebook, you know, it's, it's still ongoing. Yeah. It's getting worse in many respects. Yeah. And, you know, I have, I have 
you know, I've spent this time trying to sound the alarm. I'm still trying to sound the alarm. And, you know, I think people are kind of understanding more now, but at the same time, we haven't actually done anything to protect ourselves. And mm. so, yeah, it's more of the same, I'm afraid. Well, there's still a lot of work to be done, as you said. As I promised, now's your chance. So whoever has a question in mind or, or wants to reflect on something that Carol has said, please uh, raise your hand, and we will bring a microphone over, right on over to you. Oh, they're very Here, smart. in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> so Carol, thank you very much indeed. Um, you're very interesting indeed. Do you think, therefore, it is a government's responsibility to legislate that um, these big tech companies um, make sure that what they are uh, delivering out to the public is accurate? Or do you think it's for the big tech companies to police it themselves without having that form of legislation, which some people would potentially call um, censorship? I think, I think we don't want to get into the censorship argument in that sense. I think part of the biggest problem is just their monopolistic struck power. So I think in, like, having Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram owned by a single company of which a single man has overall control, I mean, that is, it's just a terrible, terrible idea. And I think probably all of us as well have woken up to like, you know, I don't know about you, but I've used Twitter a lot. And suddenly it's Elon Musk's Twitter that we're going to be using. I mean, this is not conducive in any way, shape, or form to a healthy pub. You know, these are our public spaces. There are public spaces. And I think, you know, I, I'm sort of interested in the people who are trying to explore alternatives to that. So something like in the 19th century, you know, we brought in parks, you know, the sort of, there was this, sort of, you know, to create places which were sort of genuinely free and open. And I think in that way that the promise of the early web had that, you know, democratizing um, a place which was genuine, felt genuinely dem democratic. And I think this, the ways that it's, we've, it's now this power is concentrated in this handful of companies, that for me, I think is probably one of the most damaging things. Great question and, and thank you for the answer. Do I see another hand? Thank you so much, Carol. <laughs> Final question, where can we follow your work? So if someone is interested in, in following what you do. Well, I have, I, I have been, I do, I have been a, a power Twitter user. I'm at Carol Cadwaller, mm -hmm. and I, I have, I, I have tweeted and tweeted my ways through this until very recently, actually, when the kind of strain, actually, of my legal case and the uh, response of the sort of British media and political establishment to the fact that the individuals and things that I were investigating are still nowhere in the public discourse around Russian influence in the UK. Mm. So I've, I'm having a quiet moment, but I'll be back, <laughs> I hope, anyway. <laughs> All right, so Twitter is the place yes. to go. And, uh, you know, I, I'm still a writer with The Guardian Observer. I've just been taking a bit of a break there as well. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, Carol. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Let's give her a round of applause.